In this video I'm going to give you a CEA tutorial. This is a program created by NASA to test various rocket fuels and oxidizers and you can use it to calculate things like thrust and specific impulse which are very useful when we want to analyze how a rocket will perform. And we're going to do an, an example problem of a real rocket engine. We're going to use SpaceX's Merlin 1D rocket engine which they use for their Falcon 9 spacecraft and I have a picture of the Falcon 9 and a picture of the Merlin engine on a test stand. The Merlin engine uses liquid oxygen and rocket propellant 1 or kerosene as its oxidizer and fuel and their advertised performance numbers are 854,000 newtons that's at 70% thrust and we are going to check that number ourselves and see um, if CEA agrees with that. They're using a chamber pressure of 9.7 megapascals and they're advertising a specific impulse at sea level of 282 seconds. We'll also check that number. Okay, they advertise a diameter of 1.25 meters. We're going to use that number to assume that the uh, nozzle exit is approximately that same diameter because that should be the the widest part of the engine so and then if you look up it's not advertised here but if if you look up at other sources they um, chose an expansion ratio of 16 so we'll also use that number so first let's go to CEA and see how to use the program so I've got a link here or you can just google CEA and you can get to it actually google CEA run will be better to uh, get to the program. Okay, the first screen looks like this, and we're going to choose rocket, and then we're going to give it a code. Let's just call it Merlin for the Merlin engine, and click submit. Okay, this next screen asks us to enter pressure values. So these are going to be atmospheric pressures, and there's only one that we're going to care about because we're testing for sea level, so we'll say one atmosphere, which is the pressure at sea level and then we'll click accept the next the next thing it's going to ask for is fuel our fuel is RP1 so we'll click that bubble uh, you can note here you can choose all sorts of different things methane hydrogen liquid hydrogen you can even use a periodic table to make more exotic fuels but we're going to choose RP1 accept again with oxidizers I have a, a lot of different choices for this problem, we it was stated that we're using liquid oxygen, so it's going to have to be cryogenic, which is very useful for performance, but adds a level of challenge when you're working with um, super cold uh, liquids. Okay, now the next portion it's going to ask for is the oxidizer to fuel ratio. And to find the O to F ratio, that was not something stated in any information I could find for this particular rocket. So what I did was I actually used CEA to do a study. So you can put in on this left side, I think I used a low value of 1, and then I used a high value of I think 10, and then I said intervals of 0.5. And then I ran the study doing that. But that's going to give you... Uh, 20 outputs so that's going to give you a large amount of data so let's not do that this time let me just show you what you would get and you would have to actually build this yourself but basically I got a bunch of ISP values versus different ODF ratios using liquid oxygen and RP1 and what you can clearly see is that there's a maximum point and this maximum point occurs at around 2 so we're going to just use an O to F of 2 for this problem now that I know that that's very likely what SpaceX would use in this particular fuel and oxidizer combo to get maximum performance. So we'll go to field 1 and enter 2 and then we'll say accept and continue. Now the next screen we have a ratio of chamber pressure to exit pressure. So this is again where we need to look at what is SpaceX advertising. So they're advertising a chamber pressure of 9.7 megapascals. Now ambient pressure, sea level pressure is 0.1013 megapascals. So if you take 9.7 divided by 0.101325 
uh, you know, it depends on how many numbers you want, you will get approximately 95 to be the ratio of those two pressures. Now the subsonic area ratio, this is the converging part of a nozzle. So as you, as I'm sure you've learned by now, to make a gas flow at supersonic speeds, you have to have it in, in a converging nozzle, which is to say it gets, the area gets tighter and tighter until you get to a throat area, which will be the tightest portion of the nozzle. And then it goes into a, what we call a diverging area where it get, the area gets bigger and bigger until you get to an exit. And you'll have subsonic speeds to the throat. The throat will reach uh, Mach 1. And then in the convert, in the diverging section, uh, it will reach supersonic speeds. So the subsonic area ratio, unfortunately, we don't really know what they use. So we're just going to guess that it's 8. So we're going to guess it's about half of what the expansion ratio is. So the supersonic one we know. It was told to us to be 16 in the literature. So those will be the numbers we use. Let's accept. And then here you can you can get into different things like equilibrium and frozen. These are different uh, infinite area versus finite area combustor. These, so these are different uh, methods to analyze the thermal chemistry. I would recommend for you don't change anything. Just leave it and then go down and hit submit. Okay, and then we get a table. It's going to tell us our problem case was Merlin. We type that in. It's going to tell us what our pressure is, one atmosphere, our pressure ratio, our subsonic area ratio, our supersonic area ratio, our O to F ratio. It's going to tell us what our fuel is, what our oxidizer is, and then it's going to give us um, results. So it's going to say here's our O to F is 2. We told it that our percent fuel then would be, if our O to F is 2, that means 2 parts oxidizer to 1 part fuel, which means 66 or so percent is oxidizer, which means 33% is fuel. And then there's a lot of other numbers. You don't necessarily need to know all of them. Uh, do notice, though, that these are the temperatures that our fuel and oxidizer are at. So they're assuming uh, C, uh, um, standard temperature and pressure for the RP1. But for the, for the O2 to be liquid, it has to be at 90 Kelvin, which is about negative 200 degrees C, if you think about it. Okay, now... We get a bunch of stuff. So you get chamber values, throat values, and then various exit points. So one way to look at this is in these different columns. If we look at this AE, the area of the exit versus area of throat, this kind of tells us where we are as you march along the nozzle. So at the throat, obviously the ratio of throat to throat is 1. And then they have an arbitrary exit point where it's 11. And they show us the subsonic portion, so that's where it's 8. And then they show us the exit, which the area ratio was 16. So we can kind of think, this is the exit, this is the start of the nozzle, this is at a point in the nozzle where our pressure ratio is exactly 95 that we put in, and then this is at the throat. And then this is what's happening inside the chamber. So. One of the things we want to notice about the chamber is the temperature. So this is estimating around 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And if you look at some of the literature uh, for SpaceX, that's about what they advertise their chamber temperature to be. I think they advertise 3,000 C Celsius, which is close to um, 3,000 Kelvin. I mean, there's a 275 degree uh, difference there, but not hugely important. Okay, then you have a bunch of energy stuff that we won't necessarily worry about. This is the molecular mass of the gas. We'll need that for the calculations. This is the uh, specific heat, and this is gamma ratio specific heat. We'll need that. And then they have a sonic velocity and they have a Mach number. And as I mentioned, notice the Mach number would be 1 at the throat. And then for our, this particular situation, they're predicting a, a Mach of 3.5 at the exit. Okay, we also have things like characteristic velocity, uh, coefficient of thrust, ISP in a vacuum, specific impulse. Uh, just notice, though, that they give specific impulse uh, by, I think it's by weight or by mass. I can't remember which is which, but this one's in meters per second. You're probably used to seeing the one that has units of second, and to get that, you have to take this value and divide by 9.81, and we'll see that in the example uh, to get an ISP that's probably more familiar to you.
So that's just a snapshot. I mean, there's a lot of information here. And you can do studies, like I said, with varying O to Fs and varying um, pressures and all sorts of things. And also you'll notice that the this actually gives you all the mass fractions of the trace elements. So if we're putting in RP1 and liquid oxygen, we're going to get a bunch of different uh, molecules, gas molecules out, and this will tell you the ratio of those things. Okay, so that's just a short, pretty quick look at CEA. Now let's see how we can actually use that to test what SpaceX and their Merlin engine would see. So this is all the, this document has all the same things I just looked at. And so here in this rocket engine example, we'll look at how do these numbers, how do we use these numbers? So we know the expansion ratio is 16, that was given. The chamber pressure is 9.7 megapascals, that was also given. The temperature we got from CA was around 3000 Kelvin. The gamma from CEA was 1.13. The pressure at exit, we're going to assume, is sea level, so it's 0.101325 megapascals. The molecular mass of the of the gas was the was 21.23. That actually comes from right here, so M from at the exit. Okay, so we got that. And then universal gas constant. The diameter of the exit plane, we're going to assume, is the diameter of the rocket engine advertised by SpaceX, 1.25 meters. Now we can use that to get the actual area of the exit. So we'll just do pi r squared. So we take the diameter divided by 2, square it, times pi. So we get 1.227 square meters. Now we want to find the area of the throat. Well, area exit over area throat equals epsilon. So just a little algebra, area of the throat should be the exit divided by the 16, or about 0.077 meters squared. So then we're going to find the exit velocity. And this equation uh, looks a little complex. You just have to be careful how you plug things in. We know gamma. We know universal gas constant. We know the temperature. We know the molecular mass of the gas. We know the exit pressure, the chamber pressure. And if you plug it in correctly, you'll get about 2,800, almost 2,900 meters per second. So those particles are coming out of the back of that nozzle pretty quickly. Okay, then we're going to find the mass flow rate. The mass flow rate is the air of the throat times the chamber pressure divided by C star. Now C star we're going to get from CEA. So based on our thermal chemistry, our characteristic velocity should be 1738.8 meters per second. So we will plug that in, and that will give us a flow rate of approximately 427.9 kilograms per second. Then we can figure out the thrust. So what kind of thrust can we expect for, for one of these engines? Well, the maximum thrust would be this, the flow rate, times the exit velocity, plus this pressure term. Now, this pressure term uh, typically only ever hurts you unless you're ideally expanded. If you're ideally expanded, your exit pressure equals ambient pressure, and this pressure term goes to zero. And we're going to assume that because we're designing our nozzle for sea level pressure. Uh, this is actually why, why rocket companies try to have expandable nozzles so that they can actually vary the nozzle exit pressure to always equal ambient so they can always get maximum thrust. That's not easy to do, however. When you multiply these two numbers, you'll get 1.2 uh, million newtons. Now, they advertise that they, they perform at 70% throttle, which means they're not going to go for max thrust right off the pad. Uh, in fact, they might not go for max thrust at all, just to save fuel and to be safe. So their percent throttle, to find that, we would take their advertised thrust of 854,000 newtons at sea level, divided by what we think their max is, times 100%. So we know, we know this is advertised, the top number is advertised, this is what we suspect the maximum could be, and we know they advertise their percent th throttle at 70. And we find that our estimated percent throttle is really close to 70%, which means that both this maximum number and their advertised number are probably very close to reality and very close to um, really maximizing their, their fuel choice. And then the final thing to check is their ISP, specific impulse. So the one from CEA was 2970.3 meters per second. 
To change that to a units of seconds, you just divide by sea level gravity, 9.81, and we get a specific impulse of approximately 303 seconds. Now let's see what they advertise for their Merlin engine. I think it's pretty close. So 303 is what we calculated, and they are advertising 282. So um, they might be having, they might have a little bit of inefficiencies uh, because you can oftentimes use the energy from your from your rocket engine to run other things, so that it kind of bleeds off some of the energy. So you're not going to get, um, but that's still pretty close. 282 is pretty close to 303. So that's a short look at CA, and it's a very useful program, and we can use it to do some calculations for a rocket to see what kind of performance we will get.